Well, you're, you're right. It was a very detailed, thorough process. Uh, you know, the process started with a Zoom call and it was about an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes. Process, you know, the length of it uh, turned out to be probably a little less than a month. Uh, then there was about seven or eight days in between the, the Zoom interview and my in-person interview here in Indianapolis. And that was a two day detailed, uh, thorough, again, the interview and the interview process uh, was mostly with uh, Kevin and Kelly and Chad. Uh, they did a great job, like you said, uh, asking the questions, being very detailed. Uh, I enjoyed our conversations. That every conversation I had had a great flow, a great rhythm. Uh, then there was probably another seven or eight, nine days that went by between my second in-person interview to you know to the final conversation. So. Uh, it did. It felt good. It felt good from the beginning. It felt good uh, when I was named the head coach, and and I am. I'm honored to be to be talking with you guys here today. It's this podcast that tailors to the diehard Pacer fan. So I think most of them know your path. They've read about your path, and they know a lot about you. But I found it very engaging when you were recently on a, a PSNE call where you were describing your personal path from head coach in Iowa. The Indians, and if you don't mind, just kind of giving us that quick synopsis of what it was like to go through the path that led you to this point. You know, it's a it's a it's a different path, and I think everybody has a different path to get to the to achieve the goals they want to achieve. You know, my path started early as a head high school coach. You know, when I grad when I finished playing college basketball and graduated from college, I wanted to be a a head coach right away and call the timeouts and draw the plays and and just uh, you know the the managing side of it of managing a team uh, being part of a of a community and uh, uh, through there it just it continued to grow in me I always wanted to play in the NBA and I found out quickly that that was not going to happen so I wanted to coach in the NBA uh, and in, in the steps that I took in order to get there I wouldn't I wouldn't trade for anything I learned so many things along the way uh, took some chances, took some risks, meaning like left, I left a couple jobs without even having a job and it kind of forced myself, you know, to get another job. I always wanted things, you know, a bigger city or better players. And I wanted to coach the best players in the world, you know, in the route that I took through my early coaching days and through my eight years in the minor leagues of professional basketball, you know, it, it allows us to to sit here today, but but again, it was a it was a different route. I think you have to take some chances on on some things, but but a route that I would I would never trade away. Everyone that has achieved a high level of success has paid their dues at some point. I started my broadcasting career in Hazard, Kentucky. Pat, I believe uh, you're broadcasting high school basketball in South Dakota. But when you're in Arizona, I believe you're 32 years old. Is that correct? When you went to um, health coach nurse on a volunteer level and were you married at that point? How did the family dynamic work? No, I was not married at that point um, So I had been teaching, you know, and and I, I had a little bit of money saved up from my from my teaching and coaching days uh, But but you're right. I uh, I drove from Phoenix to Des Moines and I wouldn't stop bugging him and emailing him and texting him and calling him for it for a job and he said he already had an assistant and and back then it was the the D League had one assistant, and that was it. Uh, so I was his volunteer assistant, and uh, and that's when I started. Uh, you know, I was substitute teaching on the side, and when I could, and when practices were later in the day, I'd teach maybe for a little bit in the morning. And I always had good people around me when I was teaching because they knew, you know, I wanted to coach, uh, and I was part of the Iowa Energy and coaching basketball so bad. But bought my own flights, drove to a number of the games, and and uh, it was all worth it. Pacers fans are so excited to, you know, see what you bring to this team. And I know initially they'll think to watching the Raptors and the style of play and the changing defenses. But did some of that box in one and triangle in two and the defenses that you use with Toronto that I think caught some NBA fans off guard? Did you work on those in, you know, the G League? And did you see at that point this could work at this level? Because a lot of the things that you guys have been able to accomplish the last couple of years are against the NBA norms. Absolutely. And, and all of those defenses you just named are great defenses that, that have been the route around the game of basketball for years and years and years. We did. We did 14 years ago, 
10 years ago, we played box and one, we played the triangle and two in the D league. So it was a, the D league was, it, it's great. Now the G league, it's a great testing ground for, for coaches, for organizations uh, to decide, you know, if the, if the kind of schemes and theories that they might want to bring to the NBA. But, but yes, it's been more of a spotlight the last, you know, couple of years with the Toronto Raptors. But, but those are things that we were doing a long time ago um, in the minor leagues. From a bigger picture perspective, Coach, how would you describe your style as a coach, as a leader of people? And does any of that have to be altered at all as you go from an NBA assistant to an NBA head coach? You have to continue to be yourself. You do. And you have to continue to pour everything into the players. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed talking with them, texting with them. And, and you know, they want to know, um, how am I going to make them a better player? What are we going to do as a team to make us a better team? And that stuff is, is, the, is very important. Uh, th there's a level of trust and confidence to develop in the players. And, and once you see that, once you see us grab a hold of that, uh, the sky's the limit. You know, the team will be capable of very uh, um, exciting things to see on the floor. It will be a fun team to watch. But, but you do, you have to pour your, your heart and your energy into the players, not only on the court, but off the court and, and to be there for them. And, and you spend a lot of time with each other and, and uh, there's a lot of things going on in, in, in the players' lives. You discussed that a little bit right there, but I'm curious, as you were hired, it was really remarkable to see the overwhelming amount of support that you received from previous players in Toronto, uh, in Phoenix, uh, current Pacer TJ Warren, who you've before. What is the dynamic that you have with the players and why do you feel like you guys have been able to accomplish uh, such close relationships? Well, I want to I want to pour everything I can into helping them become better players, meaning maybe it's a uh, uh, an all first time all star appearance. Maybe it's, um, you know, being on an all NBA team defensive player of the year. We want to imp improve their value, you know, in the marketplace and, and, and doing that, the, 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 the play the players, not only are they such great basketball players, they're great people, they're very smart. And it is, it's just, that's been my, if you want to say philosophy or my style of coaching is to pour everything I can into helping them become better basketball players. And, and it, again, once that happens and they develop that trust with me and the coaches and, and the other members of this team, then good things can happen. I think it's important to ask an, an, another question or two about Nick Nurse, because uh, you would probably say maybe you're not here or at least you wouldn't be at this point at this point in your life without what he has done. But uh, his, he has a book out. Are you suggesting maybe I, I read that and perhaps get some tips for, for what, what I'm, we might see on the, on the court of Bankers I filled out in, in about a month? Absolutely, you need to read that book. It is a very good book. I, uh, I, there were some things in the book that I, I didn't want him to give away. This was when I was still a Toronto Raptor. I didn't want to give him away our, our schemes or our strategies or – you know, some of the things that, that we hold very close um, to ourselves. So it's a ve very good book. Uh, talks about his journey through pro basketball. Uh, you would love it. In football, they have a special teams coach. They also have a get back coach. And, and with talking with Eric and also watching Raptors games, were you the get back coach for Toronto in that you had to control Coach Nurse a little bit? Because I love his passion, I love his personality, but he also. He really likes to talk to the officials. <laughs> He's, it's great. He's very competitive. He always has the best interest uh, of his players or in his mind first and foremost. But he did. He's got some fire. He's got great composure. But he, he, know, he knows when to, to uh, be a little more vocal and, and when not to be. But he, he does a great job. Very competitive. You two are obviously very close, Coach Nurse and yourself. Can you give us an idea just – how much you've fed off each other throughout your careers, things you've learned from him, things he's learned from you? Yeah, I think it's it's going through the the tough times early in the, in the minor leagues, meaning like, you know, after that fir very first season, this was, yeah, like I said, 14 years ago, 13, 14 years ago, uh, we spent a lot of time, and these are those days I was talking about before, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., 12-hour days constantly, daily had whiteboards all over his his basement walls where we were just going over everything that we possibly could 
in the game of basketball. But I just think you, you, that trust and friendship uh, with each other because we'd been through so many battles together. You know, I had coached with him. Then in the D-League, I'd coached against him. Then I'd coached against him in the NBA. Then I coached with him in the NBA. We're about to coach against him again. So there's been a lot of that, you know, back and forth. And we just I've just been next to him on so many games during our lives. And it's not even the, the regular season games. I mean, we tried to coach like everything we could possibly coach, whether it would be summer league or local tryouts or y you name it. We, we, we tried to coach it all. So you, you get a nice feel for each other of what the other might be thinking. But, you know, I think that's why he, he respected me as his assistant is it I wasn't always going to sit there and say, yep, yes, coach. Yes, coach. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, he we had a, I had an opinion and value and he valued it. And there, it wasn't always pretty as, as it looked. There was there was it was a lot of fun uh, going through the uh, the ups and downs of it. You've been a head coach before. Wondering, though, in your time in Toronto, watching Nick go from an assistant to a head coach, it's different maybe when you're an assistant and taking over at the same team. But a, a similar situation, I think, here, a team that's had some success um, but is searching for maybe a change of pace and a little bit more success. Do, can you learn anything from going through that, from Nick's perspective, going through it as a staff as you try to do something similar here in Indiana? Yeah, yeah. It's you got to continue to be yourself. Obviously, your role has changed, and 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 my role now is knowing when to push, knowing when to knowing when to challenge, knowing how to manage uh, the energy of this team. And, and and you nailed it. This team has won. This team has proven they're they're winning regular season games. They've been in the playoffs. That's that's the thing that I love the most about it is. This team that not only are they great basketball players, but they're very smart, like I said, and they're ready to take it up a notch. They're ready to take it to the next level. And we're going to experience all those things, all different things throughout the course of the regular season. So when it comes playoff time, uh, we're, we're ready to, to really dig in on, on things that we, I don't want to say practice, but things that we've experienced during regular season games. Just so you know, this is not a breaking news kind of podcast. We don't, you know, break, you know, hirings and things like that, but you're in the process of looking to fill out your staff. And I'm sure it's both challenging, but also exciting to, to look across the country and even maybe north of the border and to see all these candidates and people much like you were at one point in time. How much are you enjoying this process? Very much. You know, I've been very busy with that. Like my first job was to, you know, talking with the players and meeting the players and continuing to talk and text with them. And then in my second job, which is during the same time as forming a staff and there are so many great coaches out there so many great coaches that uh that are very capable and you'll see you'll see that we will uh, uh we'll put together a nice staff here that that uh, you will be proud uh to be coaching uh the indiana pacers you mentioned something to the pacers staff on wednesday morning that a lot of people say we want to play fast but it's it's how you do that how would you describe how you will play fast. Yeah, and it's it's a great thing that you say is is a lot of there's a lot of coaches, a lot of great coaches say that, oh, we want to play fast, but how? Oh, we want to be pressure the ball on defense, but but how? You know, and you're exactly right. We want more possessions. We're gonna have multiple players bring the ball up the floor. We want quicker outlets. We want to take advantage of two for one. So so it's 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 playing fast, more possessions, but it's the initial thrust of getting the defense on their heels. Uh, we need ball movement, player movement. And, and, and I didn't say anything spectacular there. Th those are things that, that you have to instill into the team and, and build the confidence and the trust with your team so they can do that, knowing that they can make a pass, get off the ball, and they're going to get it back, that they're all going to they're all gonna get those touches um, on the offensive side of the ball. From an analytics perspective, where do you fall maybe on the spectrum? And now as a head coach, what's the balance between analytics and gut feel for you? Analytics is, is it's very important. I think anything that you have as a coach that can help you and your team and that can help your players, you use. So absolutely, I, I will use analytics on the offensive side, on the defensive side. We want, we want to put our players in the best position to be successful on both ends of the floor, 
defensively, it's it's maybe the analytics side of it is the person who has the ball loves to drive right. So we want to make them drive the other way with their left hand. It's there's there's analytics not only on the offensive end and shooting, but it goes very deep. And you can't you can't use it all. There's so many great stats you just can't use. And and I think that's a trick of being a coach. You have to pick and choose which ones to use at which time and how to deliver that to your team. Coach, I'm wondering when you look at the roster, there's obviously going to be a draft and a free agent period. So not necessarily asking specifically, but when you look at the roster that at least portions of it you're going to have in the next season, what do you see? A lot of talent, uh, good experience. I know, And when I say that, I mean this group has, has been through – you know, the regular season, they've been through the playoffs. It's a group that's ready to jump to the next level. Uh, they've played together enough. It, 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 it's, uh, it's time that the ready to get back on the floor. They really are. They're ready for this season to start. I can sense it in their voices when I talk to them. And when I see them, I can sense it. And, and they are. They're, they're, it's a group that's ready to work. Uh, ready to work hard again and, and to get this season started. I almost feel like we're in the barber shop of the movie Hoosiers and you're we're grilling the new coach about his everything and they say man to man or zone defense. But I know three point shooting is a big deal. What is your general take on how important that should be? And do you think you have the makings of a roster that could get a few more attempts than maybe the Pacers have in recent years? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And it's multiple guys shooting them. It's more possessions. It's more three pointers attempted. It is. It's. It's getting the right three point shot. It's. It's sharing the ball to make that next pass for maybe a halfway contested shot turns into a wide open shot. It is. There's like you said. This. This team is talented. This team can shoot. Uh, th- this team is. There, there's depth that can shoot on this team. And and it is. It's a. It's a um, shot making. Shot taking will be a big emphasis uh, on our team. You had a really good backcourt in Toronto, and I know fans were happy to hear that you've been communicating with Victor Oladipo all season long. I think fans were wanting to see Malcolm Brogdon and Victor Oladipo play together. There were just such limited opportunities. What do you see from that combination if they're both coming back together? Yeah, a great combo, like you said, on both sides of the ball. Uh, Both very good defenders, tough uh, experienced, uh, and on the offensive side, they're both <clears throat> they're both versatile. They can both attack the rim. They can hit the three. Uh, they can finish through hits at the rim. They're going to get to the free throw line. It is a uh, a very dynamic, dangerous uh, combo uh, together. They uh, they're going to look great out there. You've had the chance to coach T.J. Warren, who was Mister Consistent before the hiatus, then came into the bubble and really took. Uh, the league by storm while the Pacers were there. As a former coach of his, what do you see his potential being? And maybe can uh, that version that he was in the bubble uh, be uh, taken advantage of a little bit more in your system? Yeah, he can really score that ball, TJ. And, and, and he's a good defender. He's got good size. But but as you can see, he's, his, his game keeps evolving. Uh, we're going to continue to utilize the three-point line with him. You're going to see that more and more. He's got a great ability uh, to finish off one leg, one hand, off balance, taking hits and, and finishing in the lane. Uh, he, he attacks the basket. He's a scorer. He is. He's a scorer. Uh, he's a guy I'm, I'm looking forward to coach again. And and uh, uh, he's tasted a little bit of this. He knows, he knows my coaching style. So, that's, so it's going to be great to be back with TJ. You've spoken previously about how your goal for teams is to be getting better as the season goes on, uh, while other teams are maybe fading away. How exactly do you go about accomplish, accomplishing something like that? It starts with, with the language that you use, the language that you use around the practice facility, uh, uh, you know, pregame, postgame. It's not just the coach, the assistants, and the players. It's, it's the entire organization. We do. We want to continue to get stronger as the season goes along and, and you can see on a, you know, on a typical season, sometimes after the all-star break or when things get, get tough later in the year, some of the teams start to, you know, maybe stay the same or, or fade a little bit. We want to just keep continue to get stronger and stronger. So when it comes playoff time, we've, we've reached our regular season beginning of the playoff peak 
and then it's that two and a half, three months of basketball where where in the playoffs where uh, your team can really take it up even a notch further. Nate, in a normal year, if you were to accept your first NBA coaching job, it would have likely been in June, maybe even May, and you would have had four months to move, establish some culture, work on the roster. If the, the reports are true and training camp starts in early December, and December 22nd, let's just throw out a possible date. Once again, we're not breaking news, but if that's when games start, what kind of a challenge do you have in front of you over the next month and a half? Well, that's something that that I'm used to as a coach, meaning like many times in my life, I've had to get teams ready to play in a short amount of time. You know, man, no matter when we start, you know, no matter when the, the game one is decided upon, uh, we'll be ready because I've had to do I've had lots of time in training camps. I've had short time in training camps. I've had three days. So the amount of days that we have from the start of training camp that lead up to the game one, uh, we'll be ready to go and we'll, we'll use those days wisely. On a personal level, you've mentioned on a couple of different occasions, your family looking forward to coming to Indiana. Fifth grade daughter, Katie, I saw a ball handling video on Twitter posted uh, during the quarantine. You, have you had any high school basketball coaches reach out and say, you guys need to move to our community? <laughs> no, not yet. It's, uh, yeah, my daughter Kaylee, uh, she'll be in fifth Kaylee. grade, and, and my son Jarrett, uh, he'll be in second grade. And very big basketball fans and excited to be to the great state of Indiana to, to play basketball and be a part of, you know, the school traditions on basketball games. And I'm looking forward to for them to seeing that at all levels, the high school, the college, and then, of, of course, the Indiana Pacers here, the 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 professional level of it they're they're excited for for all parts you've won a championship at multiple levels but i think we'd be remiss to not ask you about the one in toronto what did you learn about that run about your team about what it takes to ultimately accomplish that top goal yep very challenging and that's what i mentioned earlier on you know during that championship run it was the playoffs were april may and june and it's like three months of free basketball, but at the same time, the most detailed, most challenging, most high intense basketball ever played. You know, the playoffs, everything is, you know, gets gets ramped up, as you guys know. And going through that from round one to round two to the Eastern Conference finals all the way, you know, to the championship, we just saw our team continue to get better. And it's, it's the language that I was talking about before, that we want to get stronger as the season goes on. It got to the point where we would present our team the schemes and the game plan. And when the course of the games, they'd take it up another level, you know, on their own. And that just that's a testament to how smart players are in the NBA. They're, they're not only are they great basketball players, but they're very smart individuals and they can multitask and, and there's not too much you can get by them. So it was a lot of fun in that detailed progress and just the the importance of the games and you know playing a team seven times in a row and the, the changes you have to make and the adjustments that you have to make and, and going through the playoffs it was uh it was a lot of fun final thought from me and then i'll turn it over to you jj for maybe a, a question or two to close this one out um as you go forward here this is obviously a unique environment with COVID, and those who uh, are on the podcast can't see that we're in a video chat right now and you're actually uh, in the St. Vincent Center. How do you go about forming these relationships when you've got perhaps a shortened timeline um, and perhaps not the ability uh, to meet one-on-one -on -one with players like you might typically have? Right. You, you have to follow the rules. You, you have to stay safe, um, follow the guidelines. And, and, and there are many ways to connect, you know, with, with people and players. And, and we're doing one of them right now. Uh, that's why the the, the use of the computer and the, and the phone and the text messaging is, is thankfully we have many ways that we can continue to stay connected, but we just want to follow the rules on that. And when it's time that, that we can take advantage of it. Nate, I want to finish this podcast kind of where we started. And I think it's, it's a journey that so many people can appreciate in their walks of life and their careers when they had a job that maybe was difficult or low paying and they had a goal and they were able to achieve it. And I guess I would say you'll have so many people rooting for you because underdog stories are kind of what people in Indiana 
we kind of live for these kinds of things and you're easy to root for. But have you had a chance to sit down and, and maybe have a, you know, a celebratory champagne toast? I know it's all work moving forward, but this journey you've been on is amazing. And at some point, are you just kind of satisfied? Not satisfied. I can't even find the right word, but just appreciative of the journey you've been on. And now you're a coach in the NBA. No, that's okay. I, I understand your question, uh, and it's a good one. Uh, there are so many. There are so many players and people and organizations along the way that I've that I've you know had been so fond of and had so much fun working with and you know playing against. And and it is. It's not. It's one of those things that now I've never thought of it that way as a as oh you know. Oh, like take like take that breath like you've made it because as a coach you have to continue to prove and reprove and reprove and get your team ready to play so so for me it's 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 my my mindset hasn't changed this this is the beginning you know this is the the Indiana Pacers and and the things that we can do with this team so so there isn't there isn't a, there isn't time to pause or to celebrate um uh, and those types of things, it's, you know, just keeps, it keeps coming at you and you have to stay ready for it. When you win a championship, we'll allow some celebration then, right? That's the ultimate goal. <laughs> okay. That sounds great. Okay. Thanks so much for the time, Nate. Thank you very much. Nate, uh, those that listen to the Sideline Guys podcast are our most diehard, our most rabid fans, the ones that are going to be trying to get into the building on day one. I'm wondering if you quickly just have any final message for those listening. Yes. Uh, I'm really excited for my family, my wife and kids to move to Indianapolis, number one. And I'm excited to get a chance to to meet the Indiana Pacer fans and to talk to the fans and be engaged. I'm going to be at my my kids' school and their sporting events. And, and I do. I look forward to meeting everyone and talking to everyone uh, about the Indiana Pacers and and learning about uh, the, this this uh, the great state and, you know, where I need to where my kids need to go to school and the activities I can get them involved with. So I'm looking forward to, to talking to the people of not only in Indiana, but Pacer fans all over the world. New Indiana Pacers head coach, Nate Bjorkren. Coach, we wish you and your family well. Stay safe, stay well. Good luck with the travel and everything that uh, goes along with getting everybody uh, in Indianapolis. And I know JJ and I hope to see you in person and be able to talk in person soon. Uh, but until then, thank you so much for your time and your perspective. Thank you very much.